All right, so we are actually stepping out of our series in the Minor Prophets for a few weeks, um, starting this morning and then for the next two. And we're going to touch on some kind of front burner issues uh, just in light of where things are at in our world today. So first off, this morning, we're going to talk about unity, guarding our unity. These are challenging times, and Satan would love to get a foothold and cause fracturing and division in the church, and we need to be on guard and eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Um, Next week at the picnic, it's going to be shorter message. Actually, there's going to be a brief um, devotional for kids and then kind of a devotional for the adults, and it's going to focus on Romans 15, 13, so encouragement for joy and hope and buoyancy in the midst of the difficult days that we're living in. Um, I imagine you probably need to fight for buoyancy um, these days. Anybody? So we need encouragement along those lines. And then in three, on the 20th, um, we're going to talk about submission to governing authority. So what do Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2, for instance, mean for our present situation? We may not all agree on the application of these texts um, to our situation, but at the very least, we all need to wrestle with those correct questions directly. So again, this morning, focus on unity from Romans 14, 1 to 15, 7. That's our passage for this morning. So what Glenn read is a good compliment, good setup um, in chapter 12. So our world, I don't think I need to convince any of you of this. If you've spent five minutes on the news in the past week or month or whatever, our world is filled with conflict and anger and sides and division, and it is really easy to be conformed to this world. It's the air we breathe, but the gospel is the power of God to change us, to change the way that we relate to one another. We need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds lest we get kind of sucked into that caustic discourse that characterizes so much of the way people interact in our culture and the ugly divisions and it's just all over the place on the landscape today. So if we do get sucked in, then our present moment is like a recipe for disaster for the unity of the church. It's like a perfect storm. So you have polarization in politics and media tribes and fake news and on and on and racialized violence and statues, all the issues with statues of flawed historical figures and protests in professional sports. I mean, how many people in the church literally can part company over how they view standing or kneeling during the national anthem? And then COVID with You know, all the questions and opinions there, the numbers, the science, the data, the politics, the response, the guidelines, masks, et cetera, et cetera. So is our present moment a threat to our unity? Yes. So, but but threats to unity are not a new thing. Those have been around for a long, long time. Um, If you look at 1 Corinthians 1, that church in Corinth was divided and fractured. Look at uh, these verses with me. Paul wrote, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. And then he explains the situation. He heard a report that there was this quarreling and people were taking sides and, and you know, dividing up into their little tribes, you know, following this leader, that leader, or the really spiritual one said, oh, I'm of Christ. Um, so it happened then, it happens today. And again, Satan would love to capitalize on all of this in the church. Um, so we need to be aware that our battle is not against flesh and blood. We can't be unaware of his schemes. So some of you might be familiar with the book, um, The Screw Tape Letters. I see this list, anybody? All right, so basically this book is um, a fictional account of a senior demon or senior, senior devil writing to a junior devil. So the senior devil is Wormwood and the junior devil is screw tape, And he's basically kind of training him in these, you know, dark arts of temptation and so forth. And so this is from one of the early letters from Uncle Wormwood to the junior devil screw tape, And I think it captures the, the issues fairly well, even though it was written I don't know, 70 years ago or something like that. 
So one of our great allies at present is the church itself. Do not misunderstand me. I do not mean the church as we see her spread, but through all time and space and rooted in eternity, terrible as an army with banners. That, I confess, is a spectacle which makes our boldest tempters uneasy. But fortunately, it is quite invisible to these humans. All your patient, so he's saying, you know, the the man who just became a believer that he's trying to tempt and draw away from the faith, all your patient sees is half-finished. When he goes inside, he sees, goes inside the church, he sees the local grocer with rather an oily expression on his face bustling up to him, bustling up to offer him one shiny little book containing a liturgy which neither of them understands and one shabby little book containing a number of religious lyrics, mostly bad and in very small print. When he gets to his pew and looks round, he sees just that selection of his neighbors whom he has hitherto avoided. You want to lean pretty heavily on those neighbors. Make his mind flit to and fro between an expression like the body of Christ and the actual faces in the next pew. It matters very little, of course, what kind of people the next pew really contains. You may know one of them to be a great warrior on the enemy's side. No matter, provided that any of those neighbors sing out of tune or have boots that squeak or double chins or odd clothes, work hard then on the disappointment or the anticlimax, which is certainly coming to the patient. It occurs when lovers have got married and begin the real task of learning to live together. In every department of life, it marks the transition from dreaming aspiration to laborious doing. If once they get through this initial dryness successfully, they become much less dependent on emotion and therefore much harder to tempt. So we'll maybe stop right there. So the point is, it's so easy to focus on peripheral, secondary, minor, trivial things and allow those things to eat away at our unity and to push us apart. So is our present moment a threat? Absolutely. But our present moment is also a huge opportunity. An opportunity to show the world the power of the gospel to unite people. People that otherwise would not be united. Like how in the world do these people love each other like this? And that's obviously the heart of God for his people. You remember Jesus when he prayed shortly before going to the cross in John 17. It's so central to his purposes and to his heart. This is how Jesus prayed right before he died for us. John 17, 11, Holy Father, keep them in your name, He's praying for his disciples, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. The unity within the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, should be reflected and embodied by the church. And then down in verses 20 to 23, I do not ask for these only, just his present disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Our unity is supposed to be an apologetic to the world, like proof of the power of the gospel and the love of God in Christ. I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. So may God answer Jesus' prayer even among us this morning as we study Romans 14 and 15 together. So um, like Tyler mentioned, there's a sermon outline on the the live stream page. You can also follow along. The the points will be on the screen as well. All right, so point number one, welcome one another. And if you look at chapter 14, verse 1, you see it right off the bat. There's like bookends. Verse 1 and then 15, 7, both have this word welcome in in these verses. So look at 14, 1 to 3 to begin. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him but not to quarrel over opinions. And we'll get to definitions soon of what it means to be weak in faith and what we mean, what Paul means by opinions. Um, One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. 
And then if you flip ahead to chapter 15, verse 7, on the other bookend, you see, therefore welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So this word for welcome is actually used in Acts 28. Uh, Paul was a prisoner by this time. He's being taken to Rome. He's on a ship that went through this terrible storm, and they were carried along. They finally struck a reef and just off the island of Malta, and all 276 passengers made it safely to the shore. And then we read in Acts 28:2, the native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. So you see this hospitality by the people of Malta for this huge <laughs> crew from, and, and it, there were prisoners on the boat and so forth, but they welcomed everybody from the ship. So think about that picture. Or in the book of Philemon, Paul is writing to his friend Philemon on behalf of one of his runaway slaves, okay? And just for what it's worth, when you hear slaves in the, in the New Testament, it is economic slavery, not the racialized chattel slavery that is the blight on our nation's history, okay? So this formerly useless slave, Onesimus, through some wonderful providence, came in contact with Paul. Paul leads him to Christ and becomes his you know, spiritual father. So Paul sends him back to his master, Philemon, so as to not presume upon Philemon, and so that Philemon would have him back, not merely as a bondservant, but as a brother in the Lord. So he writes in verse 17, Philemon's just one chapter. He writes in verse 17, So if you consider me your partner, receive him, welcome him, as you would welcome me. So Paul, according to a couple of verses later, verse 19, is Onesimus's, um, actually, Philemon's spiritual father as well. Okay? He was converted through Paul's ministry. So how would Philemon welcome Paul? Well, wholeheartedly, with open arms. And he's saying, welcome Onesimus the same way. So two pictures of welcome that we are called to within the body of Christ here in Romans 14, 1 and 15, 7. So Positively, we are to welcome one another. Negatively, we are to do so and not divide and dispute over, quote-unquote, opinions. So what in the world is going on in Rome, and what does this stuff mean? So as for the one who is weak in faith, we need to know what that means. Welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. We need to know what that means. Otherwise, we're not going to know how to apply this. So first, what's this weakness in faith, and what are the opinions? Let's, let's actually look at the opinion thing first, okay? Does this mean that if somebody comes to your community group and they are of the opinion that the Bible says that, you know, it's okay to have sex outside of marriage or there was no historical Adam and Eve or there's no hell, that we should just say, oh, great, that's your opinion. I have a different opinion. You know, let's just all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. No. So another translation translates this word opinions as disputable matters. That's a pretty good translation. So theologians in the past long spoken of levels of importance when it comes to categorizing biblical truth and Christian practice. Okay, so some have used the language of absolutes, that's the first level, convictions, that's the second level, and then opinions. Or some have used the language of essential, important, and non-essential. Okay, so all biblical truth and certainly Christian practice is important, right? But it's not all equally important. So we use the language of first, second, third level. Um, so first level would be doctrines of, you know, the Trinity, the full deity and humanity of Christ, the, the resurrection, justification by faith alone. We could go on and on. Second level, baptism, mode of baptism, okay? So it's not unimportant. This is really important. In fact, we disagree from our brothers and sisters down the street at Faith Prez. We love them. We're not saying they're not Christians, even though they get their babies wet, okay? I'm not making fun. I, 
I would say that to Kevin. But anyway, so we disagree. That's an important thing. It has lots of implications. But we're not saying that they're not Christians. Okay? That's that first level. Okay? Third level, disputable matters, matters of opinion. So what's in that category? Well, you could probably put like um, your millennial or your uh, eschatology, like what's it going to be like when Jesus comes back, the timing and all those issues. But you can also put Christian practice things in this category like Christians and alcohol. What's a biblical perspective or stance? Christians disagree and they have their reasons. Is it okay to smoke a cigar or a pipe? School choice, private, public, homeschool, tattoos, or what age do you let your daughters get their ears pierced? Or what about a nose ring? Or cremation versus burial? Or family planning views? You know, like, is birth control morally permissible? Abortifacients aside. Is it okay to wait to have kids? Is it okay to get fixed? Is it faithless to say, our quiver is full? You see, people have opinions on these things, right? People differ on these things. People get really, like, evangelistic sometimes on these things, like sleep schedules, strict or flexible with your baby, or what movies and TV should allow your kids to watch, and when, and how much screen time, and is it okay to go trick-or-treating, and vaccination, anti-vaccination, views on capital punishment, views on the Sabbath, is it okay to cut your grass this afternoon, or play sports, or do homework, you know, like styles of music, and How people should dress on Sunday. Like, these are disputable matters. And they can pose some serious challenges to the unity and harmony of the church. Doesn't mean all those things are unimportant. We can and should have thoughtful, well-formed opinions on these things. But we've got to be able to distinguish between those things and the first and second level. Right? So the principles that we find in Romans 14 and 15 guide guide us in relation to those kinds of things, opinions, third-level issues. It doesn't relate to sin issues or first, second-level issues. So if you apply the proper posture on third-level issues to first-level issues, you're going to compromise, right? You're not going to be doctrinally faithful. You're just going to be like, eh, whatever, it doesn't matter. Let's just be gracious, whatever that means. We can have the right vibe on disputable matters and then unwisely allow that graciousness to make us loose with truth that really matters as far as what it means to be a Christian. And that's actually not gracious any longer. It's compromised. But if you apply the the posture for first-level issues to third-level issues, you're going to end up with this rigid, stifling uniformity. Everybody's got to do it all the same. And freedom and flexibility is lost. And air kind of gets stifling. So, that's what Paul is talking about here when he speaks of opinions. Okay, next question. Who is it that's weak in faith? What is is going on there? So, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him but not to quarrel over opinions. Verse 2. One person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. What? What? Or down in verse 5, one person esteems one one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Huh? So what's going on here? Who are the weak? Well, first off, we're not talking about morally weak. This is actually something we could call religious weakness. Okay? It's a person whose conscience won't let them freely do something that is not inherently wrong. So what's most likely going on here is that there are Jews and Gentiles in the church in Rome. Some of the Jews come from a background where there's kosher laws, right? And you can eat this and you can't eat that. And so even though Jesus declared all foods clean, they just can't put bacon with their eggs, you know? And that's fine for them, but if they start to say, if you're really a faithful Christian, you can't put bacon on your plate either. That's when it starts to get troublesome, and you can see you've got all this disunity. And then you've got these Gentiles that are like, let's, wrap, let's have bacon wrap bacon for breakfast, you know? 
And then they look down on these crazy, you know, what are you guys so uptight about? And they're judging and despite, you see, this is what's going on. So what do you do with that? Does Paul say, come on, you pathetic Jews, like get with the program, get over it. Jesus said, to, you know, he declared all, all foods clean. No, he actually is careful with these brothers and sisters. And so should those who are strong. So think about this. Peter, when, when in Acts 10, Jesus, you know, he gets this vision and there's this sheet that comes down and all these things that he never would have eaten as a kosher Jew. And, you know, God says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. He's like, never, Lord. I, I've never eaten anything unclean. Is he weak in faith? Well, in one sense, no. He'd already preached boldly and been beaten and imprisoned for his faith. But in another sense, religious weakness, he, he, he couldn't enjoy something that was not inherently wrong. You see? So that's what this weak in faith thing is all about. Now, there's not a lot of one-to-one -one correlation in our world today in this realm. So we need to be careful here. I mean, probably the closest thing, a couple examples of how it could be, is if you had someone who was a Muslim become a believer, and, and that person, you know, has this religious weakness when it comes to pork, right? And so the church should be sensitive. He, you know, he's not going to be able to just go out and order, you know, eggs and bacon. And that's okay. And it's not because there's a moral weakness. I mean, I might have a moral weakness when it comes to bacon, eating too much of it, you know. Um, no, it turns his stomach. It's a conscience issue for him, you see? And he's got to have that conscience trained slowly over time to realize, you know, all, all foods are clean. It's fine. So one commentator writes this way, says that the disputable matters that concern us today almost never exactly parallel what Paul addresses in this passage, but the principles in this passage directly apply to our time. So when it comes to disputable matters, matters of opinion, there's going to be the tendency to have conflict, to judge one another, to despise one another. And so whatever those third level issues might be that we might face, we can apply this passage in our lives, okay? The strong, on the other hand, would be those who are able to receive and enjoy all that God has called good without qualms or pangs of conscience, okay? So just keep those things in mind as we seek to understand and apply Romans 14 and 15. Um, otherwise, you, otherwise, you see how you'd miss it if, if we don't get our definitions right and distinguish here because what we could, you, you could hear me saying, um, you know, getting a tattoo is for the strong and not getting one means that you're weak. No. You, you, you see what I mean? The issue is getting a tattoo is a disputable matter. So you can disagree on that and it's fine. We should never be dis, you know, uh, we should never divide over something petty like that. So, what can happen when we disagree on disputable matters? Well, look at Romans 14, 3 and 4. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. Why? Because God has welcomed them both. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So this is the stuff that can happen. This is the stuff we need to guard our hearts against, passing judgment on one another, despising one another. Instead, love should be genuine, without hypocrisy, like Glenn read in chapter 12. Or look down at verse 5. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. What do you think that refers to? The Sabbath, right? The Jews would be like, We've got, we can't walk a certain, you know, number of steps on the Sabbath, and we should actually be meeting on the Sabbath maybe instead of Sunday. And no, like, you live every day to the glory of God. And the whole point in the New Testament is don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. It doesn't say you have to meet on Saturday or Sunday or whatever. It's that you meet regularly 
and you don't forsake the assembly. So, Paul says, Other, others esteem all days alike. That would be the Gentile. The Jews would say, oh, we've got to keep the festivals and we've got... Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Isn't that like crazy talk if we're talking first level issues? <laughs> this is third level issues. The one who observes the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. If, if you want to honor the Sabbath like an Old Testament Jew, fine. The one who eats, eat in honor of the Lord. If you want to eat bacon, do it to the glory of God since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and give, gives thanks to God. So God's the judge, not you and me. So if we start to judge one another on these disputable matters, these matters of opinion, who do we think we are? We're not God. We're not the judge. If God has justified, who can condemn? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, regardless of where they are on these disputable matters. So we all live unto him as our judge faithfully and we don't judge or despise one another on these third level issues. Look down at 14, 10 to 12. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? You see it? Again, same language. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. That's the only judge, judgment seat that matters. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account, not to one another, but to God. So if God doesn't condemn us over these issues, these third level issues, we dare not pass judgment on one another over them. So again, note what Paul didn't say. He could have said to the weak in faith, get over it. Like there's nothing wrong with this. So do you ever have that kind of dismissive attitude toward people who disagree with you? We all have opinions on disputable matters. We want others to come our way, to share our opinions. So how do we disagree on things, things like this as Christians, and cultivate, hear me here, genuine, not fake or superficial unity and harmony? Sometimes what we do is we back away not out of welcome and deference. We back away out of indifference. Well, we disagree on this, and I'm just going to go hang out with people that agree with me on these third-level issues, rather than actually saying, this is tertiary, like this is not central. Jesus died for both of us. So rather than focusing on or getting hung up on or judging or despising one another over opinions, disputable matters, we need a priority reset, which is where the passage goes next. So this is point number three, reset priorities. Keep first things first. We all need this reminder. Keep the main thing the main thing. So when we let third-level matters consume our focus, we are bound to argue and fight and get annoyed and judge and dismiss one another based on our opinions. Or we'll end up just kind of hanging out with the people that think like us on everything. But when first things are first in our minds and in our hearts, then we can maintain true, substantial unity around what matters most. Third level things get kept in their proper place. Doesn't mean we never discuss them. Doesn't mean we can't debate them. But it does mean that we're not going to get defined by those third-level issues, and we refuse to divide over those third-level issues. So what are the priorities in this priority reset? What does God want us to focus on? We'll look at 1417. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. That's all secondary, third level. But the kingdom of God is, of, is a matter of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So in other words, seek first the kingdom. First level unity, not third level uniformity. Right? I mean, isn't it helpful sometimes? I know for me, it's helpful to like read the voice of the martyrs and just realize what in the world am I complaining about or focusing on this petty, stupid thing? These people are like, risking their lives to follow Jesus, literally. I mean, there are brothers and sisters among us who are struggling with suicidal thoughts. 
There are abuse survivors trying to survive. There are marriages on the rocks. There are wayward kids and heartbroken, burdened parents among us. There are people out there, your neighbors, people you don't rub shoulders with, but, you know, get within six feet of, who need Jesus. Folks who are isolated and lonely and struggling, and we get fixated on, and we argue about masks. The kingdom of God is so much bigger than third-level disputable matters. It's so easy for an individual or a church to fixate on and get consumed by second-level, third-level issues. The priority check is here for us. It's a reset and it continues in verses 18 and 19. Look at them there. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. The weak should care about the strong. The strong cares about the weak. We want to build each other up. We can't be passive about the peace and the building up of our brothers and sisters. It's something we must pursue. It's a priority. It's not a matter of opinion. So Ephesians 4, Paul writes beautifully of it there. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So we've got to just refuse to divide over opinions, disputable matters. We must not judge or despise our brothers and sisters who think differently. And so that's kind of the way you describe the heart of God negatively, not judging, not despising. The heart of God positively has to do with seeking first the kingdom, pursuing what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. And another way to speak of God's heart positively for us on the path forward is the call to walk in love. So point number four, walk in love. Look at Romans 14, 13. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So don't flaunt or parade your freedom. Don't put a stumbling block in another person's way. Don't hinder their walk. Instead, walk with them in love. So love should be more important to us than our liberty, our freedom. So if you can't lay aside your liberty in order to love a brother or sister, then our liberty can be too important to us or our comfort. And not just lay it aside, but do it gladly, not, not begrudgingly, judging them all the while. Oh, if they were stronger, I wouldn't have... <laughs> this echoes what Paul said in the previous chapter, chapter 13, owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. So let us please our neighbor for his good to build him up. That's another way to say walk in love. Why? Because Jesus loved us like this. Look at Romans 15.1. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. That's love. Why? Because Christ didn't please himself. Not my will, but yours be done, dying for us in love. So we come full circle now, last point, to the other bookend. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Okay? Bookends. Welcome one another, not to quarrel over opinions. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. 
So when we get fixated on third level issues and they become the biggest things in our minds and hearts, then we think too little of the first level issues. If we are focused on small things, what happens? We get small and petty. If we are focused on big, glorious things, like the first things, the cross, the love of God, the compassion and mercy and kindness and patience and grace of God, we become gracious and magnanimous and loving and kind. So welcome one another, not to pick a fight, not to fix the other person, not to set them straight, not just to put up with one another, not just to tolerate one another, not just to be nice to their face and then you roll your eyes when you turn to leave. Or maybe you just roll the eyes, you know, in your mind. Not to avoid them and then talk about them in, behind their back in the privacy of your own home. Welcome one another genuinely despite our differences on disputable matters. So don't despise the one who's more strict or fastidious than you. Don't judge the one who's more lenient than you. We need to all just impeach ourselves daily <laughs> as the judge of the universe, kind of the reference point for the world. And let's not close the door of our heart to other people over these things. Welcome one another because God has welcomed you. If you are in Christ, think of the incredible welcome that God has extended to you. Do you think God might just disagree with some of your opinions? <laughs> Does he hold you out at arm's length because of them? Because some of us have some really screwy opinions. Does he roll his eyes when you start praying and then come to the door, you know, like knock, knock, ask, seek, knock, you know, I'm praying here, Lord. He comes to the door, oh, hi, come on in, hi, you know, listens to your prayer and then after you leave, he shuts the door and he's like, Phew, you know, glad that's over with and then he goes and sits down, with, sits down with the people he really likes to hang out with. No. His heart is genuine toward us. It's amazing despite how trivial and goofy we can be. Our welcome of others is based on God's gospel welcome of us sinners. We can welcome others because he first welcomed us. And man, we were annoying and ugly and not lovable and, you know, still are. <laughs> there are tons of things that could get in the way of God welcoming us. I mean, obviously, first, our sin. He's holy. We're unholy. There's no way we can hang out with God and be friends and reconciled unless Jesus takes all of our sin on the cross and pays that debt and reconciles us. But if you are trusting in Jesus, if you know that sin and that work of Christ on the cross and you are trusting Jesus, the welcome we have received is just almost too good to be true. It's so sweet. Our sin did not stop God from loving and welcoming us. Actually, it made him pursue us so that he could pour out his welcome and mercy and love on us. So you know what? These days, we're all a little bit more on edge, aren't we? A little bit prone, more prone than usual maybe to be irritable or angry or prickly or judgy. We need to be extra careful. So just a stupid example from my own stupid life you know, like I'm running, I think it was yesterday or Friday or something down Shipley Road, and there's a guy coming up the hill on a bike. And I like, there wasn't a car coming, so I'm like running in the middle of the road, and the guy puts his mask up as he's biking up the hill. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing? We're outside. Wind's blowing. I'm like, so far away. You know, I'm like, what am I doing? I just, I'm like judging this guy. Or me also, yesterday, in Lowe's, dude walking through without a, without a mask on. And I'm like, oh, I guess the rules don't apply. Like, I'm just falling off the horse on both sides. Like, what is what's going on in my heart? So has the Lord welcomed the COVID cautious Christians? Yes. Has the Lord welcomed the COVID bold Christians? Yes. Is there a kind of caution that can slide down into fear? 
fear and anxiety and paralysis that is sinful? Yes. Is there a boldness that can slide down into prideful dismissal or an inordinate focus on personal rights and comfort or an unloving disregard for the health and safety of others? Yes. So we should encourage and exhort both. But caution and boldness are both legitimate opinions. It's okay. And again, we could multiply examples. So we have different opinions on COVID, different opinions on how to apply COVID guidelines in the church, on immigration policy, on economics, on application of social justice, on the political landscape, and on and on and on and on and on. Do these things determine our standing before God? No. Does that mean they're unimportant? No, they are important. But let's focus on the first things and keep the first things first. Has Christ welcomed us? Yes. So listen, just, just savor. This is like, I don't know, Trader Joe's dark chocolate caramel. Caramels? I don't know. You can fill in whatever it would be for you. Listen to this, these words of welcome. Heart of God in Christ for his people. And then we're going to sing a song, and then we're going to participate in the table that Jesus set for us, and how fitting our unity. What are we doing here? What are you doing here at the table of the Lord? Well, it's only because of Jesus. It's only because of the cross. It's only because of his mercy and grace. And we are all together, one body in him. So ready? Just some sweet words of the heart of Christ, the welcome that we have in him. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved this dark, broken, rebellious world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never ever hunger. Whoever believes in me will never ever thirst. John 6, 37, whoever comes to me, whoever, I will never cast them out. Or John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Therefore, welcome one another, brothers and sisters, as Christ has welcomed us for the glory of God. And so our closing prayer, I think, fittingly, is verses 5 and 6 of Romans 15. So maybe you want to pray those along with me here in a moment. The Worship team's going to come up, and we're going to um, have a song that we're going to be led in while we prepare our hearts for communion. But let me pray these two verses. Pray along with me. Say your amen to these verses along with me. And then we may all need to just look in and say, Lord, oh, I have been judgy. I've despised. I have pulled away from shine the light in my heart, help me see where I need to repent. The table of the Lord is a family meal. We are part of this family by grace through faith in Jesus, not because of where we stand on disputable matters. So if you have repented of your sins and trusted in Christ for salvation, you are welcome at this table. And we celebrate, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And it's also a time for us to examine our hearts, not just vertically, though that's important, but also horizontally. Have I allowed divisions? Have I, you know, caused some? Have I been passive and indifferent instead of actively pursuing peace and mutual upbuilding? So let's pray this prayer and then let's examine our hearts and let's draw near to Jesus and let's draw near to one another in love. So may the God of endurance and encouragement grant us to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together we may 
with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.